Welcome back to the CCSP Exam Cram Series 2023 edition. In this installment covering every topic in the official exam syllabus for Domain 5 of the CCSP exam. As someone in a cybersecurity leadership role working with these technologies every day, I'm certain you're going to find this exam very challenging, but equally confident you will find the knowledge you take away equally relevant in your day-to-day -day role in cybersecurity. More importantly, last year I helped hundreds of thousands achieve their cybersecurity certification goals like the Security Plus exam, the CISSP, and now bringing that formula to the CCSP exam to help you be ready on exam day without the need for expensive boot camps. In the series, we'll cover the entirety of the CCSP syllabus in six installments, one for each domain of the CCSP exam. Today we're focused, of course, on domain five, and when the series is complete, I'll wrap these up into a consolidated full course video. Our focus in Domain 5 is Cloud Security Operations. And to augment your study, I recommend the official CCSP Exam Study Guide and Practice Test Bundle, which includes a thousand practice questions, two practice exams, and flashcards to help in your study. You'll find a link to the latest and least expensive version in the video description on Amazon.com. Also, to help in your study, I've included a PDF copy of this presentation. You can find a link down in the video description. And while you're down there, also note that you'll find a clickable table of contents so you can move forward and back through this video as necessary as you prepare. So let's dive into Domain 5, Cloud Security Operations. And we'll begin with a look at the exam essentials, those topics the official study guide promises will factor on exam day. We have how to ensure clustered host and guest availability. So we'll touch on resource scheduling and dynamic optimization, two topics we haven't talked about yet in the series. Explaining the importance of security hygiene best practices, in particular here security baselines. Standard processes used for IT service management in an organization. We will touch on roughly a dozen processes in this session. Change management, continuity, incident problem, availability, configuration. Access control for local and remote system access. Here we'll discuss popular remote access options, some of the finer points of security around those. Network security controls as part of a cloud environment. So we'll touch on a variety of network virtual appliances and security concepts. So intrusion detection and prevention, firewalls, honeypots, the role of the security operations center. We'll dive into incident response and we'll dive into SIM in this session as promised as security information event management is a core tool of the SOC. And finally, the role of change and configuration management. So we'll get into each of these and talk about how the two work together and how one influences the other. So that brings us to 5.1, implement and build physical and logical infrastructure for a cloud environment. So in this section, we'll cover hardware specific security configuration requirements and drill down on the HSM and the TPM, installation and configuration of management tools, virtual hardware specific security configuration requirements. So we'll touch on a handful of topics here, some the responsibility of the CSP, some the responsibility of the consumer, assuming we're talking about public cloud scenarios. And installation of guest operating system virtualization tool sets. So we'll start with the trusted platform module, the TPM, which is a chip that resides on the motherboard of the device. It's a multi-purpose device. It handles functions like storage and management of keys used for full disk encryption solutions like BitLocker, like DMCrypt on the Linux platform. It provides the operating system with access to keys, but it prevents drive removal and subsequent data access. You can certainly remove the drive, but without that TPM, you're not going to access the data on that drive. You'll also hear this called a cryptographic processor on occasion. Virtual TPMs are part of the hypervisor and provided to VMs running on a virtual platform. And unlike the HSM, it is generally a physical component of the system hardware and it cannot be added or removed at a later date. 
the hardware root of trust. Now when certificates are used in full disk encryption, they use a hardware root of trust for key storage. It verifies that the keys match before the secure boot process takes place. The TPM is often used as the basis for that hardware root of trust. It is usually that hardware root of trust. And next we have the hardware security module, HSM. This is a physical computing device that safeguards and manages digital keys, performs encryption and decryption functions for digital signatures, strong authentication and other cryptographic functions. It's like a TPM, but often a removable or external device. It's what I call a function-specific device. It's not a component of a computer, like a chip on a motherboard as a TPM is. Key escrow uses an HSM to store and manage private keys. Cloud service providers all offer cloud-based HSM solutions for customer-managed key scenarios. So the examples there would include the dedicated HSM in Azure, Cloud HSM in AWS, and Google KMS on the Google Cloud Platform. Software-defined networks may come up on the exam. So this is a network architecture approach that enables the network to be intelligently and centrally controlled or programmed using software. And SDN enables us to reprogram the data plane at any time. So if I can update the data plane using infrastructure as code or as security conditions evolve, this is going to be great for security, for a micro-segmentation strategy in a zero-trust network architecture. Common use cases, SD-LAN and SD-WAN. So separating the control plane from the data plane opens up a number of security challenges. What I'd say in short is the SDN vulnerabilities by and large come from a malicious entity inside the network. So an SDN is not really vulnerable from outside the network, but vulnerabilities can include a man in the middle attack or a, a service denial, a denial of service attack. And both of these would come from a compromised endpoint on the network. And because it's software based, it supports CICD, infrastructure as code, and micro segmentation. The segmentation of virtual networks, both your public and private subnets, are important elements of cloud network security. We'd call that segmentation or micro segmentation in a zero trust network architecture scenario. One concept related to segmentation is the virtual private cloud or VPC. This is a virtual network that consists of cloud resources where the VMs for one company are isolated from the resources of another company. And separate VPCs can be isolated using public and private networks. So the VPC term is applicable in AWS and Google Cloud Platform. They call that a VNet in Azure. And we have public and private subnets, a familiar concept even with on-premises networks. The environment needs to be segmented, public subnets that can access the internet directly and protected private networks. Virtual networks can be connected to other networks with a VPN gateway or network peering. So within the private networks of our cloud subscription, typically we're going to use network peering. It's going to be better in terms of performance. And you should have isolation as a customer on the CSP's backbone. A VPN gateway for scenarios, site-to-site -site connectivity, for example, scenarios where you need encryption. But generally speaking, we see VPN gateway in the site-to-site -site scenario and network peering within the subscription. For VDI and client scenarios, a NAT gateway for internet access usually makes sense. Section 5.1 also calls out installation and configuration of management tools, so there are a few considerations you should be aware of here. The first is redundancy. Any critically important tool can be a single point of failure, so adequate planning for redundancy should be important. Uh, just one real-world example. In hybrid cloud, we have a sync tool that synchronizes our on-premises identities with the cloud, and we typically have a backup instance on standby. So if we have a problem with that primary, we can bring the secondary online. That way, users changing passwords, group memberships that are being updated will continue to sync to the cloud and not be out of sync because our primary instance of the tool is down. 
And that need for redundancy really comes down to, is the tool we're talking about a runtime tool, or is it a design time or other ad hoc tool that doesn't affect service operation? Scheduled downtime and maintenance. Downtime may not be acceptable for some tooling, so we need to make sure that these tools are patched or taken offline for maintenance on a rotating schedule or during acceptable windows when we don't need them. For example, having our monitoring system that monitors our critical services offline for an extended period of time would more likely than not be unacceptable. Isolated network and robust access control. So with any management tooling, uh, we want to make sure that access to our tools is tightly controlled with our virtualization management tools even more so because access to the physical hosts and the VMs running there certainly increases the scope of the risk. So adequate enforcement is very important. We can use not only access control but need to know least privilege encryption with our tooling like our remote desktop client, for example, and require VPN access into a secure access workstation in the cloud, for example, to get to systems that host sensitive data and critical services. Now, when we're talking about virtualization management tools, that's a bit of a vague term. If we're thinking about the physical hypervisor host in a public cloud, that's going to be a CSP responsibility. In a private cloud, that's going to be an organization responsibility. Configuration and change management. So tools and the infrastructure that supports them should be placed under configuration management to ensure that they stay in a known hardened state, that we don't have drift in the configuration there. And then logging and monitoring. Audit trail is important, but logging activities can also create additional overhead, so we need to moderate and balance the need for logging in a manner that doesn't impact performance of the system we're collecting logs from. There are also some virtual hardware specific security configuration items called out. Because a VM shares physical hardware with potentially hundreds of other VMs, the biggest issue related to virtual hardware security is enforcement. For the hypervisor, we need strict segregation between the guest operating systems running on a single host. In a public cloud, that is especially important because we're dealing with potentially hundreds of other customers who are not part of our organization. There are two main forms of control you should be aware of. There's configuration, just ensuring that the hypervisor has been configured correctly to provide the minimum necessary functionality. So disallowing inter-VM network communications if not required and encrypting snapshots. Now in a public cloud scenario where you're consuming VMs in an IaaS model, we're talking about responsibilities of the CSP. And since you can't audit your CSP directly, that's where you go to their portal and find the documents that give you confirmation that they have implemented the necessary controls. And then there's patching. So a customer would be responsible for patching VMs in the IaaS model while the CSP patches the hypervisor. And if there are VMs in a PaaS service you're running, the CSP owns VM patching there as well. And in the vein of virtual hardware, there are a couple of particular concerns for virtual network security controls and a couple of concepts we've visited before. So virtual private cloud gives a customer a greater level of control at the network layer, including managing non-routable IP addresses and control over inter-VM communication. Now that's not talking about inter-VM communication at the host level, but within our own network, we can create multiple VPCs to prevent groups of VMs from communicating with one another, even in our own subscriptions. And this is exceedingly common in a zero trust network architecture. We'll carve out a VPC for app servers and other for the database tier. And we will restrict ingress traffic to those networks using security groups. A security group is similar to an access control list for network. In fact, it looks a lot like a firewall. It has distinct rules for inbound and outbound traffic. And in AWS, they call it a security group. In Azure, they call it a network security group. So in Azure, the interface for configuring that network security group looks a lot like a firewall. In AWS, they call a security group a virtual firewall. 
So just to give you some exposure to the concept I'm talking about there, I'd like to do a quick demo and we'll take a look at securing virtual networks with security groups. And notice here, when I say security groups, I'm talking about a security group in this specific network context. This isn't like a security group that contains users and is used to provide access to resources assigned to people. So I'll just switch over to a browser to the Azure portal here, portal.azure.com, and I'm going to take a quick look at network security groups from a couple of different angles. So we'll start by looking just at the network security groups themselves. And you'll notice here that I have network security groups for FE, which is front end, so think front end app server, back end, think back end database server. So if I click on front end NSG here, what it's going to show me are the configuration elements of this NSG. So I can see the inbound security rules and take a look at these rules here. So we see the name of the rule, we see the priority, and when we scroll over, we can see the port and protocols that are applied and if it's an allow rule or a deny rule. And as you might imagine, you see the rule at the bottom there is a deny rule. So if no allow is found, all inbound is denied if not explicitly allowed. So I'll click add here so we can just add a rule. And you'll see I can define source port ranges so I can make very specific rules. So if I want to create an RDP rule, for example, for remote desktop, I'm going to use 3389 and lock that rule down to that specific port. And you'll see I can get down to IP addresses or specific application security groups and tags. That's something specific to Microsoft Azure, but in any cloud provider, you're going to find that typically you can define IP addresses or ranges of IPs, and then we can pick services. So you'll notice here it gives me a standard list of services so I can decide what protocol I'd like to send through. So you notice when I pick HTTPS, the destination port is automatically set to 443. Now in the Azure context, these network security groups can be applied in two ways. They can be applied to the network interface of a VM directly which is fairly common and I can click the associate button and it will show me any network interfaces that don't have an NSG. And I can assign them to subnets. This is much more common. So you'll notice this NSG is assigned to the FE subnet. So the front end NSG is assigned to the front end subnet. So that inbound outbound rule set applies to that entire subnet in that case. Now I'm going to just give you a look from another angle. Here's a virtual machine and I mentioned that an NSG, a network security group, can apply to a VM interface as well, to its network adapter. So if I scroll down and get into the networking here, you can see that an NSG has been applied to this network adapter and there's the name of the network security group and the inbound rules. So notice there there's an RDP rule, remote desktop protocol, and I can add inbound rules right here. So what you have here looks a lot like a layer 4 stateful packet inspection firewall. So that's a quick look at NSGs. I hope that gives you a better idea of what security group means in the network context. And finishing up section 5.1, guest operating system virtualization tool sets. So the tool sets that exist that I'm talking about would come from the maker of the hypervisor and provide extended functionality for various guest operating systems, be those Windows or Linux. For example, Hyper-V integration services enhance VM performance and provide several useful features. Things like guest file copy, time sync, guest shutdown. In the public cloud, these tool sets will typically be provided by the CSP in some capacity. That brings us to 5.2, operate physical and logical infrastructure for a cloud environment. So let's look at the roughly dozen topics we need to touch on here, beginning with access controls for local and remote access. So we'll touch on RDP, SSH, jump boxes, and more. Secure network configuration, topics like VLAN, DHCP, DNSSEC, and VPN. And in network security controls, we have some overlap here with a discussion we're going to have in section 5.6. So I'm going to carry a few topics from this section of 5.2 forward. I'll let you know when we get there. 
uh, know that we won't skip them. I just want to consolidate this to, to a more natural single discussion of topics like firewalls, IDS, IPS, and honeypots. Operating system hardening through the application of baselines, monitoring, and remediation. Patch management. Infrastructure as code strategy. Infrastructure as code is foundational in the public cloud in particular. Absolutely the norm, so we'll dig in to the details there. Availability of clustered hosts. This delves into the physical and isn't really even specific to cloud, so this will be a bit more academic in terms of discussion. Availability of guest operating systems. Performance and capacity monitoring. Hardware monitoring. Again, an area outside your corporate data center that is the responsibility of the CSP. Configuration of host and guest operating system backup and restore functions. And we'll finish up 5.2 with a look at scheduling, orchestration, and maintenance in the management plane. Because this is such a big section of Domain 5, I'm going to track this a little more closely for you. So we'll begin with 5.2.1, Access Controls for Local and Remote Access. So we have in local and remote access, remote desktop protocol, the native remote access protocol for Windows. We have Secure Shell, which is the go-to for Linux operating systems, very popular in remote management of network devices. So these are going to be utilized by the CSP and the consumer alike. RDP and SSH both support encryption and MFA. Secure terminal or console-based access. This is a system for secure local access. This is going to be the realm of the CSP in the public cloud. So that's using a KVM typically with access controls, basically allowing you keyboard access only at your system through a layer of security at that physical shared keyboard. Jump boxes, at least what they call jump boxes in the CCSP exam. You might hear these called jump servers elsewhere, but it's a bastion host at the boundary of lower and higher security zones. So CSPs offer services for this. Azure Bastion on the Microsoft platform, the AWS Transit Gateway for Amazon. Virtual clients, software tools that allow a remote connection to a VM for use as if it's your local machine. R very common example here would be VDI, Virtual Desktop Infrastructure for Contractors. And access to any of these can generally be gated with some form of privileged access management solution on the identity and access management platform used by the CSP. Next, we have VPN. So this extends a private network across a public network, enabling users and devices to send and receive data across shared or public networks as if their devices were directly connected to the private network. And you have split tunnel versus full tunnel. So full tunnel means using VPN for all traffic, both to the internet and corporate network. Split tunnel uses VPN for traffic destined for the corporate network only and internet traffic direct through its normal route. You'll see split tunnel very commonly in work from home scenarios. And then we have remote access versus site to site. So in site to site, IPsec site to site VPN uses an always on mode where both packet header and payload are encrypted. This is IPsec tunnel mode. And in a remote access scenario, a connection is initiated from a user's PC or laptop for a connection typically of shorter duration. That's IPsec transport mode. So data in a remote access session must be encrypted in transit using strong protocols like TLS 1.3 and session keys, session keys that ideally are good only for that session, so they are useless if discovered for later sessions. Strong authentication you know, may be combined with cryptographic controls such as a shared secret key for SSH and or MFA. And previously in the series, we've talked about strong MFA factors, device state, and other conditions of access being applied to an authentication request. Enhanced logging and reviews. All admin accounts should be subject to additional logging and review of activity and frequent access reviews. Privileged access solutions in identity as a service solutions often include an access reviews feature. 
use of identity and access management tools. So many CSPs offer that identity as a service option that enables strong authentication and access control schemes right out of the box. Examples would include Azure Active Directory on the Microsoft platform, Google Identity Services for GCP, and single sign-on is very important to the user experience. So your identity as a service solutions typically enable users to log into other services using their company accounts. Many identity as a service solutions function as a single sign-on provider. A general best practice for administrative users is the use of a dedicated admin account for sensitive functions and a standard account for day-to-day -day use. I want you to remember that for the CCSP exam. For the real world, I want to tell you that while that's listed in the common body of knowledge for the exam, it is not always true. And that's because increasingly, identity as a service solutions offer privileged identity management or privileged access management for just-in-time privilege elevation, enabling us to run an account without privilege day-to-day, -day, and when we need admin access for a few minutes or a few hours, we can elevate, do our work that requires privilege, and then our elevation either expires or we self-revoke. It's a more granular version of least privilege, and I'll show you in a live cloud environment here in just a moment. So solution features typically offer temporary elevation of privilege, approval gates, an audit trail when privilege is activated, and an access review process to avoid permissions sprawl. So again, the CCSP is not focused on one CSP, but we'll take a look at privileged access management in one of the major providers here, just for context, understanding that the features will vary by cloud service provider. Now I'll just switch to my browser here, and I'm in the Azure portal, and have navigated to the Azure Active Directory Admin Center. I'll click on Azure Active Directory, and we're going to look at the Privileged Identity Management feature, which is one of several privileged access management capabilities we find on the Microsoft platform. I'll click on Identity Governance, and under Privileged Identity Management, I'll click Azure AD Roles, and I'm going to look at the Global Admin role. So if I just type Global Administrator, we have a privileged identity profile here, and I see Adele has been assigned access to this profile. So let's look at the settings of the profile and see what that means when she activates this global administrator profile. Well, it means she gets global administrator rights for up to eight hours, at which point it's automatically revoked. Upon activation, we're requiring Azure multi-factor authentication. We are requiring justification, so she has to write us a little note in a long text box to tell us why she's activating. We can require a ticket on activation. This is set to no at present and we're not requiring approval, though those are features we can turn on. So I'll click edit here and you'll notice here I can turn this up to as much as 24 hours. So we were at eight hours in our current settings and I can turn on notification. Notification is a popular option when we decide not to require approval. Folks always behave when they know everybody else is being notified that they've activated this privilege role. So it gives us a nice audit trail, but it gives us something almost as good as approval. But in that case, the user doesn't have to wait for approval. And we no doubt trust the folks that we're assigning access to this privileged role. And you see here, I can require the ticket. I can turn those extra features on if I like. Now, I want to just back out of here and talk for a moment about the access review option. So you'll see here under manage, I have access reviews. For the privileged identity management feature, I can configure access reviews for my privileged roles to see if users still need access. So here's my global admin review. I can set a start date. I can set a frequency. I like to review these sensitive roles at least quarterly. And if I scroll down here, you'll see that I can select the role or roles that I would like to audit. So I could basically configure one review that kicks off for all the roles. So a user will have to review any role that they're a member of. 
So I see all active and eligible assignments. So eligible is how we do this. The user is eligible to activate the role. It's not permanently activated, meaning they don't have privilege all the time. And for reviewers, you'll notice here that I can assign a manager, I can select a specific reviewer, or my favorite, let the reviewers basically self-review and tell me if they still need access. And when I scroll down here, you'll notice that upon completion, once the review period is over, if the users don't respond, I can make no change. I can remove their access or automatically approve their access. I can choose how I respond if the user fails to reply. And I have a healthy number of notification options that I can configure here to make sure the right people are in the loop that we've gone through that access review process. So that's just a quick look. Again, there are multiple privileged access management features in Azure AD, and you'll find similar features on other identity as a service platforms. I just wanted to give you some context for some of those capabilities we were talking about earlier in this session. And we're gonna move on to 522 secure network configuration. So we'll talk security around VLANs, DHCP, DNSSEC, TLS, VPN, just to name a few. I want to start by revisiting the zero trust security concept, which we've touched on earlier in the series. A strategy where no entity is trusted by default, moving on from the trust but verify strategy of years past. And it addresses the limitations of the legacy network perimeter based security model, where we trust everything on our trusted network and everything outside that perimeter firewall is untrusted. Now we're trusting no entity. It treats user identity as the control plane, and it assumes compromise or breach in verifying every request. But zero trust network architecture is another element of a zero trust strategy in an enterprise. So network security groups factor here, network firewalls, inbound and outbound traffic filtering, inbound and outbound traffic inspection, and centralized security policy management and enforcement. So network security, the network security group provides an additional layer of security for cloud resources. It acts as a virtual firewall of sorts for virtual networks and resource instances like VMs, databases, subnets. It carries a list of security rules, IP addresses and port ranges that allow or deny network traffic to resource instances on a subnet. It provides a virtual firewall for a collection of cloud resources with the same security posture. It exists in multiple CSPs. The details are going to vary slightly with each. They call it a security group in AWS. They call it a network security group in Azure. So when we segment our network, we can use a security group to act as an ingress and egress filter for the segments of our network. So perhaps I have a subnet for my app, a subnet for my databases, a subnet for management infrastructure. So that's enough for now. We're going to revisit this a bit later and I'll actually get into a security group with you hands-on so you can get a good look at that feature. So segmentation that I was just referring to, restricting services that are permitted to access or be accessible from other zones using rules to control inbound and outbound traffic. So we use rules that are enforced by the IP address ranges of each subnet and within a virtual network segmentation can be used to achieve isolation. It's port filtering through a network security group. We can do filtering through a firewall. But in that micro segmentation scenario, we're going to use a security group or what they call a network security group in Azure. It's a security group in AWS. And our VPC, our virtual private cloud, contains private subnets. And each of these subnets has its own site or IP address range and cannot connect directly to the internet. They could be configured to go through the NAT gateway if outbound internet connectivity is necessary. Client VMs and database servers will often be hosted in a private subnet. And there are actually three private subnets that are predefined. So private subnets are not for public services like websites, but there are three private IP address ranges that are defined. There's 
the 10.0.0.0, so that's a class A. You have the 172.16 to 172.31, that's a class B. And then the 192.168.00, which is a class C. These private ranges are defined in RFC 1918 and not routable over the public internet. All other IP address ranges, except the self-assigned range, the 169.254, all others are public addresses. So just as you would use these in your own data center, these same private ranges are equally applicable in the cloud and used frequently. So in a secure network design, we have to account for east-west traffic. This is where traffic moves laterally between servers within a data center, or in this case, within our virtual data center, which is our cloud subscription. North-south traffic moves outside of the data center. That's ingress and egress. VLAN, which is a collection of devices that communicate with one another as if they made up a single physical LAN. And it creates a distinct broadcast domain that can span multiple physical network segments. So on a switch, we can assign ports to a VLAN. So if I have my finance department spread across multiple floors, I could have members of the finance department on their own private VLAN so their work with sensitive data never leaves that distinct broadcast domain. They're within their own virtual local area network. Then we have a screened subnet. That's a subnet placed between two routers or firewalls. Bastion hosts are often located within a subnet like this as maybe web servers. You hear this called a perimeter network or a DMZ sometimes. So to wrap up the VLAN discussion, many public clouds offer the virtual private cloud functionality, essentially a sandbox area within the larger public cloud. It's network space dedicated to a specific customer. Different CSPs have different names for it. Microsoft calls the VPC a VNet, a virtual network. But VPCs take the form of a dedicated VLAN, essentially, for a specific user organization. It means other cloud tenants are blocked from accessing those resources. And a given customer can spin up multiple VPCs within their subscription and allow or prevent communication between those VLANs, those essentially dedicated VLANs. So we have a couple of options for VPC connectivity, connecting those virtual networks, so to speak. So we can create a VPN connection using L2TP or IPsec using a VPN gateway, or a transit gateway it's sometimes called. Now, to connect VPCs within our subscription, we can use network peering. That's another method for connecting virtual networks in the cloud. So peering is the more common option between cloud networks within a subscription. And then for hybrid connectivity back to our corporate network, that's when we'd use a VPN. We'd use a site-to-site -site VPN, effectively creating a hybrid cloud. Moving on, let's talk DNS security. So DNSSEC, DNS Security Extensions. It's a set of specifications primarily aimed at reinforcing the integrity of DNS. It achieves this by providing for cryptographic authentication of DNS data using digital signatures. It provides proof of origin and it makes cache poisoning and spoofing attacks more difficult. It does not provide for confidentiality since digital signatures rely on publicly decryptable information. Encrypting data in motion is often achieved through transport layer security. That's how it's done for secure HTTP, for secure web sessions. And TLS in that web context uses an X.509 certificate with a public-private key pair. So for customer public-facing websites, you'll typically use a certificate from a trusted provider like a DigiCert or a GoDaddy. For secure sessions on internal sites within your organization, many organizations will have their own public key infrastructure to issue certificates because it only needs to be trusted by members and devices of their organization. If you're preparing for the CCSP exam, you're likely already familiar with the core functionality of DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, issuing IP addresses dynamically to endpoints coming onto the network. There are a couple of niche security discussions to be had here relevant for the exam. 
So one is the idea that the IP address associated with a system event can be used when identifying a user or a system. So our SIM, our Security Information Event Management solution, can leverage this data to track an IP address to a specific endpoint. We really need to just let our SIM ingest those DHCP logs to leverage that data for greater context. There's another niche discussion to have, and that's that some hypervisors offer a feature to limit which network cards are eligible to perform the DHCP offer, which can prevent rogue DHCP servers from issuing IP addresses to clients and servers. So we can prevent a rogue VM from being spun up and configured as a DHCP server. So that sort of protection is going to be the responsibility of the CSP in a public cloud scenario, as the CSP is responsible for the configuration of that physical host, that type 1 hypervisor. And in a private cloud, in a corporate data center, that's going to be the responsibility of the organization. You should be familiar with methods to provide non-repudiation, so the guarantee that no one can deny a transaction. Digital signatures prove that a digital messenger document was not modified intentionally or unintentionally from the time it was signed. Digital signatures use asymmetric cryptography, a public-private key pair, the digital equivalent of a handwritten signature or a stamped seal. A couple of common methods for implementing non-repudiation include message authentication code, or MAC, where the two parties that are communicating can verify non-repudiation using a session key. Electronic financial transfers or electronic funds transfers frequently use MACs to preserve data integrity. And then there's HMAC, or hash-based message authentication code, which is a special type of MAC with a cryptographic hash function and a secret cryptographic key. So HTTPS, some secure FTP options, and other transfer protocols use HMAC. So just breaking down a few cryptographic concepts. Cryptography provides a number of security functions, including confidentiality, integrity, and non-repudiation. So your encryption tools like TLS or a VPN can be used to provide confidentiality. Hashing can be implemented to detect unintentional data modifications. Integrity is the focus there. Additional security measures like digital signatures or HMAC can be used to detect intentional tampering. HMAC and simultaneously verify both data integrity and message authenticity. And up next is network security controls, topic number three in that long list of 12 topics within section 5.2. We'll start with the last one on this list, Bastion Host. So a Bastion Host is a host used to allow administrators to access a private network from a lower security zone. So the system We'll have a network interface in both the lower and higher security zones, and the host itself will be secured at the same level as the higher security zone it's connected to. When you're accessing sensitive resources, generally speaking, the system you are accessing them from should be secured at the same level or greater. Now, we've talked about Bastion Host by another name already in this series, and that is Jumpbox. Jumpbox or Jump Server are two common names for Bastion hosts. And CSPs offer services for this. There's Azure Bastion and AWS Transit Gateway, which offer Bastion host functionality, usually with additional conveniences. For example, Azure Bastion allows you to connect via RDP or SSH to Windows and Linux systems directly from a browser, so you don't need an endpoint client. You don't need an RDP or SSH client. But in whatever form, think of a Bastion host as a dedicated host for secure admin access. There are several other network security controls in the list there you should have basic familiarity with in terms of functionality and their strengths. So in the realm of firewalls, stateless and stateful, application host and virtual firewalls, web application firewalls or WAFs, the next generation firewall, or NGFW. In the intrusion detection and prevention systems, host-based IDS, HIDs and HIPs, network-based IDS, NIDs and NIPs, 
and hardware versus software. And in terms of other security controls, the honeypot and vulnerability assessments. Now, we're going to touch on all of these in section 5.6, and the conversation would be largely redundant. So we're going to press pause on these, and we'll cover these in detail later in this session in 5.6. And for now, we'll move on to the fourth item on the list, operating system hardening through the application of baselines, monitoring, and remediation. The OS hardening is the configuration of a machine into a secure state through application of a configuration baseline. Baselines can be applied to a single VM image, or we can apply that baseline to a VM template, which we create once and then use that to deploy all our VMs. And a hardened image may be a customer-defined image, a CSP-defined image, or it could be from a third party often available through a cloud marketplace. A great example of a third party is the hardened image set you can get from the Center for Internet Security, CIS, who offers hardened images in CSP marketplaces. In fact, if you want to build your own hardened image, you can also buy the scripts from the Center for Internet Security directly. But I find many customers just opt to use the CIS images from the marketplace of their chosen CSP. Let's dig a bit deeper into configuration baselines and related concepts. So we have the concept of a control, which is a high-level description of a feature or an activity that needs to be addressed, and it's not specific to a technology or an implementation. A security control is an example where we describe a level of security that needs to be achieved without discussing the specific implementation. A benchmark contains security recommendations for a specific technology, like an ISVM, or maybe we're talking about an identity as a service provider, like Azure Active Directory or Cisco Duo, or Google's identity services. And then we have a baseline, which is the implementation of the benchmark on the individual service. So a control is expressed as a benchmark, and a benchmark is implemented as a baseline through a baseline. The benchmarks describe configuration baselines and best practices for securely configuring a system. You'll often see platform or vendor specific guides released with new products so that they can be set up as securely as possible, making them less vulnerable to attack. Web servers, for example, the two main web servers used by commercial companies are Microsoft's Internet Information Server and the Linux-based Apache. Because they're public-facing, they're prime targets for hackers. And to help reduce the risk, both Microsoft and Apache provide security guides to help security teams reduce the attack surface, making them more secure. These guides advise updates being in place, unneeded services are disabled, and the operating system is hardened to minimize risk of security breach. And just as with web servers, Operating system vendors, like Microsoft, have guides that detail best practices for installing and securing their operating systems. OS benchmarks are also available from CIS and other third parties. Application servers. Vendors produce guides on how to configure application servers like email servers or database servers to make them less vulnerable to attack. And the list goes on. Network infrastructure devices from companies like Cisco produce network devices and offer benchmarks for secure configuration of their network hardware. At the end of the day, benchmarks aim to ease the process of securing a component, reducing the attack footprint, and minimizing the risk of security breach. And diving into some of the details of OS hardening, we want to Minimize listening ports and running services, restricting to those that are absolutely necessary, filtering traffic, disabling some ports entirely if unneeded. We can block ports through firewalls. We can disable listening ports entirely by disabling the underlying Windows service many times. Then there's the Windows registry, and access should be restricted and updates controlled through policy wherever possible. We always want to take a backup of the registry before we start making changes. Disk encryption, so drive encryption, full drive encryption we call it, can prevent unwanted access to data in a variety of circumstances. 
So full disk encryption is BitLocker on the Windows platform or DMCrypt on Linux. And OS hardening can often be implemented through security baselines that come from the vendor. And they can be applied through Active Directory group policies or management tools like mobile device management platforms such as Microsoft Intune or AirWatch. And we can implement all of these using configuration baselines. I wanted to call out a few sources for configuration baselines for OS hardening in particular. That is the exam objective called out in the syllabus after all. So we have vendor supplied baselines. Again, Microsoft, VMware, and Linux all offer configuration guidance for their products that point out specific security options and recommended settings. But they all have configuration guidelines and in the case of Microsoft, for sure they offer configuration baselines you can download as a starting point. DSA STIGS, so the Defense Information Systems Agency produces baseline documents known as Security Technical Implementation Guides, or STIGS. Now I will warn you that the DSA STIGS may include configurations that are too restrictive for many organizations. After all, their audience is government, so the regulations around security on the whole are going to be more stringent in that space. And then we have NIST checklist. So the National Institute of Technology and Standards maintains a repository of configuration checklists for various OS and application software. Another agency focused on a government audience. So likely, again, some guidance you can use and some that may be a bit too stringent for the average commercial company. Then we have CIS Benchmark. So the Center for Internet Security publishes baseline guides for a variety of operating systems, applications, devices, all of which incorporate many security best practices. And CIS offers benchmark scripts that are priced based on environment size. If you go to your CSP marketplace, you'll find VM images that give you a ready-made hardened image if you want to go that route for your OS hardening. But as you can see here, you have a number of options available to you. Next on the agenda in 5.2 is patch management. There are a few basics you want to be familiar with on exam day. Patch management is sometimes called update management, really just two names for the same discipline. And it ensures that systems are kept up to date with current patches. The process will evaluate, test, approve, and deploy patches. So we need to design that process. Often we use what I call a ring strategy, where we'll deploy to a small group of users, usually within the IT department, then in a second ring to a broader sampling, a pilot group across business units, before we deploy broadly to the organization. System audits verify the deployment of the approved patches to the system. And we want to make sure we patch both native OS and third-party applications. It's pretty common that organizations of lesser maturity will not get around to patching third-party apps, which leaves security holes. And we want to apply out-of-band updates promptly. So if a software provider supplies a security patch out-of-band, it's usually because it is an urgent situation. And cloud service providers generally provide a patch management feature tailored to their IaaS offering. Up next is Infrastructure as Code Strategy. Infrastructure as Code is the management of infrastructure, our networks, VMs, load balancers, and connection topology described in code. Just as the same source code generates the same application binary, code in the Infrastructure as Code model results in the same environment every time it's applied. In fact, Infrastructure as Code is a key DevOps practice, and it's used in conjunction with continuous integration and continuous delivery. In fact, Infrastructure as Code is very common. It's really the standard in the cloud. Now, the CSPs typically offer cloud-native controls for implementing Infrastructure as Code. Microsoft offers Azure Resource Manager. Amazon offers AWS Cloud Formation. These tools make managing the respective Cloud resources easier on each platform, supporting infrastructure as code, but they are 
separate tools for separate platforms. They're platform specific. Now, third party tools add more flexibility, functionality, and multi platform support. Organizations will typically move to third party IAC solutions when the native cloud solutions do not meet their functionality needs or they become a multi cloud customer. So, for example, some organizations move to Terraform for infrastructure as code because it supports the major CSPs using a single language. And CSPs offer a marketplace where third parties can publish offers related to infrastructure as code. Now, there are two distinct characteristics of infrastructure as code that improve resiliency in IaaS and PaaS service models. And I want to make sure you're familiar with these for the real world, if not for the exam. So, the term declarative. Infrastructure as code must know the current state. It must know whether the infrastructure already exists to know whether or not it needs to create it. Imperative deployment methodologies are unaware of current state. If you write a PowerShell script, for example, or a Python script, that is an imperative deployment methodology. It doesn't know if the infrastructure already exists. Infrastructure as code, when implemented through the CSP native tools or solutions like Terraform, are also idempotent. Deployment of an infrastructure as code template can be applied multiple times without changing the results. For example, if the template says deploy four VMs and three exist, only one more is deployed. But these characteristics help reduce errors and configuration drift because we can apply the infrastructure as code template multiple times and the result will always be the same. It will be an environment exactly as is described in the infrastructure as code template. Up next, we'll talk about the availability of clustered hosts. And we're really talking about clustered virtualization hosts, the physical servers hosting our hypervisor. So that's the realm of the CSP in the public cloud, but our responsibility in the corporate data center in a hybrid cloud scenario. The cluster advantages include high availability via redundancy, optimized performance via distributed workload as the cluster can push VMs to different members of the cluster to distribute the load, and availability to scale resources. So let's start with the cluster management agent. It's often part of the hypervisor or load balancer software. It's responsible for mediating access to shared resources in a cluster. Reservations are guarantees for a certain minimum level of resources available to a specified virtual machine. A limit is a maximum allocation. A share is a weighting given to a particular VM. A share value is used to calculate percentage-based access to pooled resources when there is contention in those resources. Distributed resource scheduling is a coordination element in a cluster of VMware ESXi hosts. So DRS is VMware specific. It mediates access to the physical resources. It handles resources available to a cluster, reservations and limits for the VMs running on the cluster, and maintenance features. Dynamic optimization is Microsoft's DRS equivalent delivered through their cluster management software. Storage clusters pool storage, providing reliability, increased performance, and possibly additional capacity. All of this tech is CSP owned in the public cloud and organization owned in a private or hybrid cloud. Next, we're going to talk availability of the guest operating system. And we're really talking about the guest operating system in the IaaS context in this case. We've deployed a virtual machine in the IaaS model. And it's important to recognize that once a VM is created in IaaS, the CSP no longer has direct control over that guest operating system. The customer can use baselines, backups, and cloud storage features to provide resiliency in the guest OS using vendor-supplied OS baseline templates, for example, or cloud storage redundancy features like zone or geo-redundancy, or backups, and in virtualized cloud infrastructure, this might involve the use of snapshots. Fortunately, your CSPs offer backup features for VMs in the IaaS model. 
Resiliency is achieved by architecting systems to handle failures from the outset rather than needing to be recovered. For example, virtualization host clusters with live migration provide resiliency. But resiliency of the physical hypervisor cluster, networks, and storage are responsibility of the CSP. So next we'll take a look at performance and capacity monitoring. Now the CSP should implement monitoring to ensure that they're able to meet customer demands and promised capacity because the cloud provides the perception of unlimited capacity but in reality is a highly scalable platform of finite infrastructure resources cleverly oversubscribed. So consumers should monitor to ensure the CSP is meeting their obligations in terms of performance and availability. Most monitoring tasks will tend to be in support of the availability objective, monitoring for service availability first and foremost. Alerts should be generated based on established thresholds and appropriate response plans initiated when objectives are not being met, when thresholds are breached. Monitoring should include utilization performance and availability for compute, for CPU, memory, storage, and network. That's what we call the core four. And just as reviews make log files impactful, appropriate use of performance data is also essential. If it's not used, it is wasted and increasing cost and nothing more. Next up is hardware monitoring. So this is definitely in the public cloud going to be the purview of the CSP. In the private cloud, that's where it falls to the customer in their corporate data center. So physical hardware is necessary to provide all the services that enable the virtualization that enables cloud computing. And again, hardware monitoring should monitor CPU, RAM, fans, disk drives, network components, any point of failure in that physical infrastructure. Environmental monitoring is also important. Computing components are not designed for use in very hot, humid, or wet environments. So HVAC temperature and humidity monitoring are all important. And in public cloud, hardware monitoring will be the responsibility of the CSP and not the consumer. As with many topics, it comes down to that shared responsibility model and knowing our role. Next, we'll talk configuration of host and guest operating system backup and restore functions. So responsibility varies by category. So we're gonna go beyond the OS for just a moment here. In the SaaS model, the CSP retains full control over backup and restore. So if there are operating systems behind the scenes, the CSP owns it all. The only customer responsibility there is typically a shared responsibility for their own data. In the PaaS model, shared responsibility, CSP owns the infrastructure backups, consumer owns backups of their data. In the IaaS model, the consumer owns backup and recovery of VMs. So consumer backups may include full backups, snapshots, or definition files used for infrastructure as code deployments. Customer choice in that case. There are a few additional considerations. So sensitive data may be stored in backups. And in this case, access controls and need to know principles will limit exposure. Physical separation is important. Backups should be stored on different hardware or availability zones. So using zone redundant or geo redundant cloud storage, for example. Integrity of all backups should be verified routinely to ensure they're usable. And that brings us to our final topic in section 5.2, the management plane. So the management plane in the cloud provides virtual management options analogous to physical admin options of a legacy data center. For example, the ability to power VMs on and off provisioning virtual infrastructure for VMs like RAM and storage. It includes orchestration. This is the automated configuration and management of resources in bulk. This would include features like patch management and VM reboots, which are very commonly orchestrated tasks. And the management console is the web-based consumer interface for managing resources. And they'll typically be command line 
equivalent as well. It's very important though that the CSP ensure that management portal calls to the management plane only allow customer access to their own resources. Up next is 5.3, implement operational controls and standards like ITIL and ISO IEC 20000-1 or part one. In short, we're talking service management and topics in 5.3 will run the gamut of service management, including change management, continuity management, information security management, continual service improvement management, incident, problem, release, deployment, configuration, service level, availability, and capacity management. So fully a dozen different subsections within 5.3. So what is ISO IEC 20000-1? Well, it specifies requirements for establishing, implementing, maintaining, and continually improving a service management system. It supports management of the service lifecycle, including planning, design, transition, delivery, and service improvement. So these topics are all relevant for both the consumer and the CSP. Your role varies based on the cloud model, but relevant to the CSP and the consumer just the same. So we'll start with a look at configuration change and asset management. And I'm covering these three together because of their interrelated nature. One does impact the other. So change control refers to the process of evaluating a change request within an organization and deciding if it should go ahead. Requests are generally sent to a change advisory board, or a CAB for short, to ensure that it's beneficial to the company. This typically requires changes to be requested, approved, tested, and documented. So we have change management, which is the policy that details how changes will be processed in an organization, and change control, which is the process of evaluating a change request to decide if it should be implemented. So change management is guidance on the process. Change control is the process in action. And in an environment that leverages CICD and infrastructure as code, change reviews may be partially automated when new code is ready for deployment. The level of automation is going to vary by maturity, whether it's continuous delivery or continuous deployment, but automation is quite common. And this reduces operational overhead and human error reduces security risk, enables more frequent releases while maintaining a strong security posture. And if you haven't already, you'll find that CICD and infrastructure as code are the norm, not the exception in the cloud. Configuration management ensures that systems are configured in a similar way. Configurations are known and they're documented. Baselining ensures that systems are deployed with a common baseline or starting point and imaging is a common baselining method, whether it's in IaaS with virtual machines or it's containerization, imaging, VM templates, or container images are very common. A baseline is composed of individual settings called a configuration item. Change management, on the other hand, reduces outages or weakened security from unauthorized changes. Versioning uses a labeling or numbering system to track changes in updated versions of software. And configuration management and change management together can prevent incidents and service outages. Continuity management focuses on the availability aspect of the CIA triad, and there are a few standards out there related to continuity management. The CCSP exam may mention the NIST Risk Management Framework, or RMF, and ISO 27000, both of which deal with business continuity and disaster recovery terms that fall under the larger category of continuity management. We have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, which governs healthcare data in the United States and mandates adequate data backups, disaster recovery planning, and emergency access to healthcare data in the event of a system interruption. Remember, your number one responsibility as a security professional is human safety nowhere more apparent than with HIPAA. And then there's ISO 22301, Security and Resilience in Business Continuity Management Systems. This specifies the requirements needed for an organization to plan, implement, and operate and continually improve the continuity capability. 
So for the exam, remember these are all associated with business continuity, disaster recovery, and availability. They are in one way or another relevant for both customer or consumer and the CSP. The goal of information security management is to ensure a consistent organizational approach to managing security risks. It's the approach an organization takes to preserving confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the CIA triad, for systems and data. There are several standards that provide guidance for implementing and managing security controls in a cloud environment, and those include ISO 27001, 27017, 27018, 27701, the NIST Risk Management Framework, NIST SP800-53, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, and the SOC 2 standard from the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants of all places. And we've talked about the importance of SOC 2 reports already. And being familiar with all of these at a high level will be good insurance on exam day and very useful to you throughout your cybersecurity career. So the standards we're talking about here are all related to development of information security management standards for an organization. So let's just cover these a bit further at a high level. We have ISO IEC 27001, which is a global standard for information security management that helps organizations protect their data from threats. There's ISO 27017, which is a security standard developed for cloud service providers, for CSPs and users, to make a safer cloud-based environment and to reduce the risk of security problems. We actually cover 27017 at some depth back in Domain 1 in Section 1.5. Then there's 27018, which is the first international standard about the privacy in cloud computing services. It is a code of practice for protection of personally identifiable information in public clouds acting as PII processors. This will be covered in depth in Domain 6 in Section 6.2, so we'll get a bit further into 27018 a bit later in this session. ISO 27701 extends the guidance in 27001 to manage risks related to privacy by implementing and managing a Privacy Information Management System, or PIMS. I think it's best if I describe the NIST RMF and CSF together, that's the Risk Management Framework and the Cybersecurity Framework from NIST. So the Risk Management Framework's audience is the entire federal government, and the CSF is aimed at private commercial businesses, although both address cybersecurity risk management. The RMF is mandatory, and the CMF is voluntary, of course. Then NIST SP800-53 provides a catalog of security and privacy controls for all U.S. federal information systems except those related to national security, so it's a government audience there again government-focused, and the guidance follows FIPS 200. And then the SOC 2 standard is a framework that's seen wide adoption among CSPs as well as the use of a third party to perform audits. And that's important because it provides increased assurance for business partners and customers who cannot audit the CSP directly because they have far too many customers to allow it. You'll remember earlier in the series when we went to the CSP portals, and so we can download that SOC 2 report to gain that assurance. This is another standard that will be covered in depth in Domain 6 in Section 6.2. Moving on to Continual Service Improvement Management. One critical element of Continual Service Improvement includes the areas of monitoring and measurement, which often take the form of security metrics. And metrics need to be tailored to the audience they will be presented to, which often means executive-friendly. Business leaders will be less interested in technical topics. The metrics should be used to aggregate information and present it in an easily understood, actionable format. Next up is incident management, and there are a couple of concepts you want to be familiar with here. The first is an event. Events are any observable item, including routine actions, such as a user successfully logging into a system. 
Incidents, by contrast, are events that are unplanned and have an adverse impact on the organization. Now, all incidents should be investigated and remediated to restore the organization's normal operations and to minimize adverse impact. Not all incidents will require the security team, but certainly the CCSP exam focus is security. So the incident management framework that you can expect to see in focus on this exam is quite likely going to be NIST 800-61, the Computer Security Incident Handling Guide. It's a very popular standard. It's called out in the common body of knowledge. It's covered in depth in this course in section 5.6, Manage Security Operations. So we'll be talking about the Computer Security Incident Handling Guide from NIST here very shortly, greater depth. I did want to mention the incident response framework from SANS, SANS 504-B. That includes six steps, which starts with preparation, where incident response plans are written and configurations documented. Identification, which determines whether or not an organization has been breached. Is it really an incident, in other words? Step three is containment, limiting damage, the limiting the scope of the incident. Step four is eradication. Once affected systems are identified, coordinated isolation or shutdown, and then rebuild and notify relevant parties. Step five is recovery. Root cause is addressed, and time to return to normal operations is estimated and executed. And then step six, or phase six, helps prevent recurrent and improve IR processes. I wanted to share the SANS incident response phases here for two reasons. Number one, you're going to see them again in your cybersecurity career. Number two, when we dive into NIST 800-61 a bit later, you're going to notice a number of parallels. Problem management. So in the ITIL framework, problems are the causes of incidents or adverse events that impact the CIA triad. Problems are, in essence, the root cause of incidents. Problem management utilizes root cause analysis to identify the underlying problems that lead to an incident. It also aims to minimize the likelihood of future recurrence. An unsolved problem will be documented and tracked in a known issues or known errors database. And in the world of problem management, a temporary fix is called a workaround. Next up is release management. So today, traditional release management practices have been replaced in large part with release practices in agile development methodologies. The primary change is the frequency of releases due to the increased speed of development activities in continuous integration and continuous delivery, or CICD. Release scheduling may require coordination with customers and the CSP, so it may not be fully automated, but it's certainly going to be partially automated. The release manager is responsible for a number of checks, including ensuring change requests and approvals are complete before approving the final release gate. Changes that impact data exposure may require the security team. Some of the release process is often automated, but manual processes may be involved, such as updating documentation and writing release notes. From a security perspective, it's worth noting that the increased automation and pace of release in Agile and CICD typical to the cloud necessitates automated security testing and policy controls. Agile and CICD are the norm for the cloud. Deployment management. So in more mature organizations, the CD in CICD stands for continuous deployment, which further or fully automates the release process. Once a developer has written their code and checked it in, automated testing is triggered, and if all tests pass, code is integrated and deployed automatically. Less manual effort means lower cost, fewer mistakes, faster releases. Although it's worth mentioning that even organizations with continuous deployment may still require some deployment management processes to deal with deployments that can't be fully automated. Processes for new software and infrastructure should be documented. Containerization, managed Kubernetes, is common in mature organizations supporting more frequent deployment in public cloud environments. 
Kubernetes is the de facto standard for containerization. And fully automated deployment requires greater coordination with an integration of information security throughout the development process. So security is everyone's responsibility. We call that DevSecOps. Next, we have service level management, which focuses on the organization's requirements for a service as defined in a service level agreement, or SLA. SLAs are like a contract focused on measurable outcomes of the service being provided. And SLAs should include clear metrics that define availability for a service and exactly what availability means. SLAs require routine monitoring for enforcement, and this typically relies on metrics designed to indicate whether the service level is being met. And as a consumer or a customer of a CSP, your cloud infrastructure decision should be made with your application's SLA in mind because defining the levels of service for your cloud infrastructure is usually up to the cloud service provider in public cloud environments. So you need to make sure that the IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS components that you choose as part of your solution architecture have SLAs that will support your overall service SLA. But customers should monitor their CSP's compliance with the SLAs promised with the various services, including service credits for SLA failures. Oftentimes your CSPs provide financial backing for their SLAs, so you want to make sure that those credits are received when they're due. Availability management. Now a service may be up, that is to say the service is reachable, but not available, meaning it cannot be used. And availability and uptime are often used synonymously, but there's an important distinction. Availability means the specific service is up and usable. For example, authentication and authorization must work and request must be fulfilled. If the users can't get their request fulfilled, the service is not truly available. Many of the same concerns that an organization would consider in business continuity and disaster recovery apply equally in availability management. BCDR plans aim to quickly restore service availability in adverse events. So BCDR and availability management align in many respects. Other concerns and requirements like data residency or the use of encryption can complicate availability, but customers have to configure services to meet their requirements. This responsibility lies firmly on the customer or consumer in most cases. Cloud consumers do have a role to play in availability management. How much depends on the cloud service category, whether it's IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS. We know the customer has the most control in the IaaS category. And to round out section 5.3, we have capacity management. So one of the core concerns of availability is the amount of service capacity available compared with the amount being subscribed to. For example, if a service has 100 active users but only 50 active licenses available, that means the service is over capacity and 50 users will be denied service. Which calls attention to the fact that capacity issues can be physical, such as the underlying CSP's infrastructure, or logical issues like licenses, for example. Measured service is one of the core elements of cloud computing, so metrics that illustrate demand for the service are relatively easy to identify generally. Responsibility for capacity management belongs to the CSP at the platform level, but belongs to the customer for deployed apps and services. So the customer, the consumer, must choose appropriate service tiers and design their app to scale to meet demand. The cloud provides the perception of unlimited capacity, but in reality is oversubscribed by design, and our CSP must monitor how much is too much oversubscription. And here again, customer versus CSP responsibility will vary in accordance with the cloud service category, whether we're talking about IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS. Up next is 5.4, Support Digital Forensics. In this section, we'll talk about forensic data collection methodologies, evidence management, and collecting, acquiring, and preserving digital evidence. The CCSP exam does not expect that you're a digital forensics expert, but it does assume that you're familiar with the special challenges of forensic data collection in the cloud, as well as the standards that outline best practices and processes for digital forensics. You may see questions on e-discovery, 
So e-discovery or electronic discovery is the identification, collection, preservation, analysis, and review of electronic information. E-discovery is usually associated with the collection of electronic information for legal purposes or in response to a security breach. There are roughly a half dozen forensic standards you should be familiar with for the exam. Most of these are ISO IEC standards, so that's the International Organization for Standardization. And there's one from the Cloud Security Alliance you should be familiar with as well. So we'll go through each of these at a high level. So ISO IEC 27037 is a guide for collecting, identifying, and preserving electronic evidence. ISO IEC 27041, a guide for incident investigation. 27042, a guide for digital evidence analysis. And 27043, a guide for incident investigation principles and processes. ISO IEC 27050 is a four-part standard within the ISO IEC 27000 family of information security standards. It offers a framework, governance, and best practices for forensics, e-discovery, and evidence management. If you were going to do your own investigation, this would be a standard to be familiar with, but generally speaking, hiring an outside forensic expert is the best path for most organizations if they don't have a forensic expert on staff. Now, the CSA security guidance comes in Domain 3 Legal Issues, Contracts, and Electronic Discovery. This offers guidance on legal concerns related to security, privacy, and contractual obligations, it covers topics like data residency and liability of the data processor role. The data processor role has a lot of responsibility around data security, storage, tools, collection, and transfer. Next, let's talk about some considerations around forensic data collection. Number one, logs are essential. All activities should be logged, including time, the person performing the activity, the tools that are used, the system or data inspected, and the results. You should document everything, including physical or logical system states, applications running, any physical configurations of hardware, as well as any security around the system, including physical security, physical access. The person on the other side of the conversation may be an opposing party trying to identify instability in the system state or a lack of physical security that places the data that's been collected into question. And consider volatility. Volatile data, data that is not on durable storage, requires special handling and priority. Generally speaking, you want to collect data from volatile sources first. An example of a volatile data source would be system memory, which is going to be potentially erased over time or on system reboot. We'll get a bit deeper on volatility a bit later in this section when we talk about data collection, handling, and preservation. There are also a handful of evidence collection best practices called out that you should be familiar with. Utilize original physical media. So use physical media whenever possible as copies may have unintended loss of integrity but this is during collection. Verify data integrity at multiple steps using hashing, especially when you're performing operations such as copying files. You'll want to run a hash on the original file and then a hash of the file after the copy to ensure that they match, that there's no loss of integrity or data in that copy. Follow documented procedures. Dedicated evidence custodian, logging all activities, leaving systems powered on to preserve volatile data. And establish and maintain communications with relevant parties, such as the CSP, internal legal counsel at your organization, and law enforcement in the case of a security breach for guidance and requirements. The considerations we covered right there are enough to send many organizations to an external forensics expert. We will talk about communication with relevant parties and communication plans in section 5.5. Next, we're going to move into evidence management, and I want to just refresh your memory on a couple of concepts we touched on in domain two. The first is legal hold. 
which involves protecting any documents that can be used in evidence from being altered or destroyed, sometimes called a litigation hold. If you see litigation hold, that's just another name for legal hold, generally speaking. And another very important concept when it comes to forensic data collection, chain of custody. This tracks the movement of evidence through its collection, safeguarding, and analysis life cycle. It documents each person who handled the evidence, the date and time it was collected or transferred, and the purpose for that transfer. It confirms appropriate collection, storage, and handling. And chain of custody is of paramount importance in legal proceedings. Scope of evidence is very important as well. So this describes what is relevant when collecting data. And in a multi-tenant cloud environment, this can be particularly important because collection from shared resources like cloud storage may expose other customers' data if they did not fully erase their data before they left. And if the CSP does not adequately manage scope, they may expose sensitive data of an unrelated company, potentially exposing you, the consumer, to unneeded liability. The scope of data collection is definitely going to be a bit more challenging in the cloud for this reason alone. But it's certainly not the only challenge. So the cloud comes with several challenges when it comes to forensic investigation and data collection. So one of these is data location. Do you know where the data is hosted and the laws of the country it's hosted in? Many cloud services store copies of data in multiple locations. Rights and responsibilities. So what rights for forensic data collection are listed in your CSP contract? And if it requires CSP cooperation, what is their response SLA? Tools. Are your forensic tools suitable for a multi-tenant environment, for a highly virtualized environment? What is your organization's liability if you unintentionally capture another customer's data on a shared resource because of inadequate tooling decisions that you made? Remnants of a previous customer's data on physical storage, for example. Because as we've discussed in previous domains, the consumer is responsible for data destruction, and if they don't practice crypto shredding, they may leave remnants behind for the next customer to find in a situation such as forensic data collection. But these aren't the only considerations. So laws and regulations also impact a consumer's ability to perform forensic data collection in the cloud, because cloud data should generally be stored and have data sovereignty in the region or country where it's stored. And many countries have laws requiring businesses to store data within their borders. So when we talk about that problem of knowing where your data is, many times the law requires you to know where your data is. The U.S. introduced the Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data, or Cloud Act, in 2018 due to problems the FBI faced in forcing Microsoft to hand over data stored in Ireland. It aids in the evidence collection in investigation of serious crimes. That was the intent. And in 2019, the U.S. and the U.K. signed a data sharing agreement to give law enforcement agencies in each country faster access to evidence held by cloud service providers. So while there are certainly many laws that are targeting consumers, commercial companies with customer data, there are also laws targeting the CSPs. So a lot to consider there, which means verifying audit and forensic data collection rights with your CSP to ensure you understand your rights and their legal obligations before you sign contracts is very important. So going a bit further down the road here, forensic investigators should know their legal rights in every jurisdiction, every region or country where the organization hosts data in the cloud. Some countries will not allow e-discovery from outside their borders, so you may be required to hire an agent in-country. Now, chain of custody in traditional forensic procedures is easy to maintain an accurate history of time, location, and handling, due at least in part to the fact that we know where the data is located. In the cloud, physical location is somewhat obscure. However, investigators can acquire a VM image from any workstation connected to the Internet. And because your cloud data centers where you store data may be hosted around the world, timestamps and offsets can be more challenging due to the varying geographic locations. 
and maintaining a proper chain of custody, thus more challenging in the cloud because we have to record that sequence of events. Who collected the data, how they collected the data, what data was collected, and when they collected that data, and from where. But with the variance in physical location, it means the where and when can be more challenging to track. And breach notification laws vary by country and regulations. For example, GDPR requires notification within 72 hours, and that applies to all with EU customers, even if it's a third-party breach. So if you are a company located in the United States and your CSP experiences a breach in the EU, you are responsible for notifying your customers if that breach impacts their data. So remember, a first-party breach begins within the company. A third-party breach would be outside the company. But data residency and data sovereignty are certainly more challenging in the cloud due to the many potential locations of our data centers and the fact that many cloud services will make multiple copies of our data and store them in multiple regions for redundancy reasons. So once we've managed to collect the data, let's talk about the utility of evidence or the usefulness of that evidence. So evidence should possess five attributes to be useful. It needs to be authentic. The information should be genuine and clearly correlated to the incident or crime to which it's attributed. It needs to be accurate. The truthfulness and integrity of the evidence should not be questionable. Evidence should be complete and all evidence should be presented in its entirety even if it might negatively impact the case that's being made. In fact, it's illegal in most jurisdictions to hide evidence that disproves a case. Evidence should be convincing, so the evidence should be understandable and clearly support an assertion being made. And that is to say evidence presented to support a fact should clearly support that fact. Chain of events presented from audit logs, for example, should be clear and show the chain of events clearly. Admissibility. So evidence must meet the rules of the body judging it, such as a court, and the bar for admissibility will vary based on the body judging it. Hearsay evidence, which is indirect knowledge of an action or evidence that has been tampered with, may be thrown out by a court. Courts typically set a higher standard than regulators for admissibility of evidence. And chain of custody is going to be one of the many key elements that support or negate admissibility. The so requirements for evidence to be admissible in a court of law, going one level deeper, evidence must be relevant to a fact at issue in the case, makes a fact more or less probable, essentially. The fact must be material to the case. The evidence must be competent, which means reliable. It must be obtained by legal means. Evidence obtained by illegal means will be thrown out by a court. To prevail in court, evidence must be sufficient, which means convincing without question, leaving no doubt. Now we're going to shift gears and talk evidence acquisition and preservation. So let's start with the importance of collecting evidence. So as soon as you discover an incident, you should begin to collect evidence and as much information about the incident as possible. Evidence can be used in subsequent legal action or in finding an attacker's identity. Evidence can also assist you in determining the extent of damage. And as we discussed, some evidence is volatile. It's not going to be there forever. It will disappear over time and with system reboots. So collecting evidence as soon as you know there's an incident is very important. Control is important. Using a cloud service involves loss of some control and different Service models offer varying levels of access. On the whole, we have the most control as a customer or consumer in the IaaS model and the least in the SaaS model. Multi-tenancy and shared resources factor because evidence collected while investigating a security incident may unintentionally include data from another customer. This is most likely if the CSP or delegate were performing forensic recovery from a shared physical resource like a storage array. If a customer managed to not encrypt data or they were not holding the keys, there's potentially some residual data there that could be uncovered in a forensic data collection operation. 
data volatility and dispersion. So cloud environments support high availability techniques for data like data sharding. Sharding breaks data into smaller pieces, storing multiple copies of each piece across different data centers. I've mentioned data volatility a few times, so let's unpack that a bit further. So to determine what happened in a system, you need a copy of data, and volatility tells us which evidence we should collect first. If it disappears in a system reboot, or power loss or the passage of time, that evidence is volatile. So here's the approximate order of volatility. It starts with CPU cache and register contents. It goes down through routing tables, live network connections, memory, so your RAM, temporary files, all the way down to data stored on archival media and backups. So pretty common sense in most cases here. For the exam, remember that volatile, perishable information should be collected first. You don't need to remember the order of volatility. I just wanted to make sure that the concept of volatility is crystal clear. This is a niche topic of one subject within a large exam, but bottom line, remember that volatile information should be collected first. Now there are four general phases of digital evidence handling, starting with collection, examination, analysis, and reporting. And there are a number of concerns in the collection phase relevant to the CCSP exam. So proper evidence handling and decision-making should be part of the incident response procedures and training for team members who are performing response activities. Now let's talk evidence preservation and the concerns in preserving evidence. So this is really about how to retain logs, drive images, VM snapshots, any other data sets for recovery or internal and forensic investigations. Protections for evidence storage would include locked cabinets or safes, dedicated or isolated storage facilities, environment maintenance, making sure that we maintain proper temperature and humidity, access restrictions, and documentation or tracking of activity. So when evidence is checked out, there should be a record of that. When evidence is checked in, there should be a record of that. What and who and when. And blocking interference, so shielding data from wireless access. And that speaks to integrity. If someone came in to investigate or view evidence with a mobile device, they could potentially access that data through wireless. That's where a Faraday cage comes into play. If evidence is being examined, that examiner would not have a mobile phone with them. And bottom line here, you collect originals and you work from copies so you don't impact the integrity of the original unintentionally. Let's take just a minute or two and look at a few examples of areas and considerations around evidence acquisition. And most of these examples are applicable to the IaaS model. So we have disk, also known as hard drive. So was the storage media itself damaged? Uh, random access memory, which is volatile memory used to run applications. The swap or page file, which is used for running applications when RAM is exhausted, also itself somewhat volatile. The operating system, was there corruption of data associated with the OS or applications? The device, when police are taking evidence from laptops, desktops, and mobile devices, they take a complete system image. And the original image is kept intact, installed on another computer, hashed, and then analyzed to find evidence of any criminal activity. Are you seeing the underlying theme here of integrity? So continuing on, firmware, embedded code, this is going to be more applicable to the virtualization host, which could be reversed engineered by an attacker, so an original source code would have to be compared to code in use. That really steps out of our role as the consumer down to the CSP who's hosting in a public cloud scenario. So in this case, we'd need a coding expert to compare both lots of source code in a technique called regression testing, because rootkits and backdoors are concerns in this area. But in a public cloud situation, this would essentially be a third-party breach. This would be the CSP's responsibility to deal with. So we'd hope that they have incident response procedures in place and are going to be cooperative with us if we're impacted as a customer. A snapshot. If the evidence is from a virtual machine, a snapshot of the virtual machine can be exported for investigation. Cache. Special high-speed storage that can be either a reserved section of main memory or an independent high-speed storage device. 
Doesn't matter if it's memory cache or disk cache, both are going to be volatile. Network. So the OS includes command line tools like Netstat that provide information that could disappear if you reboot the computer, so you'll want to run those commands soon after the incident is discovered. Like RAM, connections are volatile and lost on reboot. And in the TCP IP world, may be lost before that, just through the passage of time. Artifacts. Any piece of evidence, including log files, registry hives, DNA, fingerprints, or fibers of clothing, normally invisible to the naked eye. We're focused on cloud computing here, so you know which of these apply to cloud computing, but now you know what an artifact is. Integrity. So I've mentioned integrity as an underlying theme here. So hashes. When either the forensic copy or the system image is being analyzed, the data and applications are hashed at collection. It can be used as a checksum to ensure integrity later. Files can be hashed before and after collection to ensure a match on the original hash value to prove data integrity. I even use hashing when I am archiving my system log files. When I archive my syslog, I hash the file I'm about to upload to the cloud before I copy it and after I copy it so I know that the hashed copy of the file that arrived matches what I sent from the syslog server so it ensures integrity. Provenance. So data provenance effectively provides a historical record of data and its origin and forensic activities performed on it. It's similar to data lineage, but it also includes the inputs, entities, systems, and processes that influence the data. Uh, in case you're not familiar with data lineage, that's the process of tracking the flow of data over time, showing where the data originated, how it's changed, and its ultimate destination. So provenance also shows us what's happened to that data, the inputs, the entities, the systems, and the processes that touched it. For the exam, Hashing is far and away the most likely of these to appear on the exam. So make sure you understand the importance of hashing in integrity. And just some final words on evidence preservation. So data needs to be preserved in its original state so that it can be produced as evidence in court, whether that's legal proceedings or if we are pursuing legal action against an attacker in a data breach. Original data must remain unaltered and pristine. So what is a forensic copy? Well, an image or exact sector-by-sector -sector copy of a hard disk or other storage device taken using specialized software, preserving an exact copy of the original disk, whether that is a physical disk or a copy of our virtual VM disk, which is stored on physical shared storage at our CSP. Deleted files, slack space, system files, and executables, and documents renamed to mimic system files and executables are all part of a forensic image. And putting a copy of the most vital evidence in a worm drive will prevent any tampering with the evidence because you cannot delete data from a worm drive. And you could also write protect or put a legal hold on some types of cloud storage. And on that topic, I want to jump into a live CSP subscription and look at log collection and retention across a few different cloud services to talk about how that relates to preserving potential evidence. So we'll switch over to a browser here and take a look at a Microsoft Azure subscription. So that's my primary CSP. And I'll take a look at a storage account here. So I'm just going to look at a pretty standard storage account. And right up here under overview, I see activity log. And if I look at the logs here, I can export my activity logs. It tells me that when I configure this export, that I can export different log categories. And you'll notice I can choose my destination here. So I can archive to another storage account. So that's a form of retention. I can send this over to a log analytics workspace, which would allow me to then query on that data, potentially generate alerts, and I can even send over to some other sources not so important here, including a partner solution. So if I had a third-party SIM, I might send over there. Now, in this case, if I don't know exactly what these categories mean, the CSP, Microsoft in this case, gives me a link to learn more about those categories. And they are well explained here in a web page, so that's really helpful. And if we just back out of there... 
want to scroll down and look under redundancy here, I talked more than once about the challenge of just knowing where your data is located. So in the redundancy area here, I see this is a geo-redundant storage account, and the CSP provides me a map to show me where my data is hosted. So I see here that my primary region is South Central U.S., and its geo-redundant partner for disaster recovery is North Central U.S. So they generally pick a backup more than 300 miles away, as we talked about back in Domain 1. So let's switch gears here and jump over to a PaaS service. We're going to look at SQL Server. And here under the overview, I do see an activity log area, and I can export my activity logs. And again, similar interface as we saw with the IaaS service with the VM. I have an option here to configure some category exports to, in fact, the same locations. Now, jumping over one level down, I want to look at a virtual machine, so an IaaS scenario. And there's a logging option here. It appears to be more performance-based. So this is more about monitoring system health and performance than the activities of the VM itself. And we can look around here to see if we have absolute consistency in the types of logs. And sure enough, we do see activity logging available here in that same export function. So it's fairly uniform across the various services. But if we come over here to our cloud-based SIM, Microsoft Sentinel, which is what I've shown you in previous examples, if we go down to the data connectors, which is how we ingest data into a, a typical SIM, we can see here that if I just search, for example, by the word Windows, I see I can ingest Windows Firewall data. So that's going to give me a lot of relevant information for my SIM in terms of the events, what's coming in, so the ingress and what's going out, the egress. If I also search on the word security, I see that when I scroll down here, I can gather security events from a Windows system using the Azure monitoring agent. If I search for SQL, I can expect to find an option for my Azure SQL databases. So the PaaS service has an option here for data ingestion that eases that burden. And just switching gears one more time, I want to go back to the storage account. So if I decide that I'm going to archive data in a storage account, and I do this frequently myself, for example, with syslog data. So I come to my storage account here. If I go down to containers, which is where I would store data, think of it as a folder. If I come into my backups folder here, for example, you'll see that I can establish an access policy. And there's an option for immutable blob storage. So storage that cannot be altered, ensuring the integrity is intact. And I see here I can use this for time-based retention, which is something I do all the time. So if I want to keep my archive logs for seven or eight years, I'm going to set a retention here based on the number of days up to the level of retention that I'm comfortable with. But there's also an option here, which is the legal hold, a concept we talked about briefly in this domain and prior. And with a legal hold, we'd typically associate this with one or more tags, which is an identifier like a case ID as in a legal case. So point being, in the cloud, we have many options for data logging, log aggregation, and log retention. It's up to you as the consumer to be familiar with the options your CSP makes available to you. And that brings us to 5.5, manage communication with relevant parties. We'll touch on our communication strategy with vendors, customers, partners, regulators, and other stakeholders, which will vary by situation. And while best practices certainly exist for communication plans, we'll talk about the influence of company security policies and regulatory compliance requirements on our communication plan. And just like disaster recovery and business continuity come with a plan, communication starts with a plan, a plan that details how relevant stakeholders will be informed in the event of an incident, like a security breach. That would include a plan to maintain confidentiality, such as encryption, to ensure that the event does not become public knowledge, at least before we are ready. That plan should include a contact list 
That includes stakeholders from the government, police, customers, suppliers, our internal staff, and the order of operations. Compliance regulations like GDPR include notification requirements like relevant parties and timelines. For example, GDPR has a 72-hour clock on a security breach that involves sensitive data. I want to just unpack confidentiality one more time. So confidentiality amongst internal stakeholders is important, so our external stakeholders are informed in accordance with our plan, so they are not surprised by a news report. This sort of breach could have long-reaching consequences. It can affect the stock price in the short term. It can impact customer and partner trust in the long term and for the long term. So I mentioned a plan needs to include our stakeholders, who we need to inform and manage. And other stakeholders is that nebulous category we should unpack. A stakeholder is any party with an interest in an enterprise. For example, corporate stakeholders include our investors, employees, customers, and suppliers, our supply chain. And regulated industries, like healthcare and banking, are going to have requirements driven by the regulations governing their industries. That will influence who we need to have on this list to communicate with. The first step in establishing communication with vendors is an inventory of critical third parties upon which the organization depends. This inventory will drive vendor risk management activities in two ways, really. Some vendors may be critical to the company's ongoing function, like the CSP, for example. Others may provide critical input to a company's revenue generation, such as a partner who processes credit card transactions. And vendor communications may be governed by contract and service level agreement. Now, as cloud consumers, most companies will be the recipient of communication from their chosen CSPs. And while customers should define communication SLAs where they can, they should at least monitor those of the big CSPs, which are typically going to be predefined. Partners often have a level of access to a company's systems similar to that of the company's own employees, but they are not under company control. Communication needs to evolve with your partners through that relationship. Communication at onboarding will evolve into a maintenance mode as we have a day-to-day -day relationship with that partner, and then there's certainly an offboarding communication sequence, which may involve handoff to a new partner. So you'll notice not all of the communication we're talking about here is strictly incident-driven, but I think we can safely assume there's going to be a bit of an incident-driven focus on the exam. Then we have regulators. Most regulators have developed cloud-specific guidance for the compliant use of cloud services. And your regulatory standards like GDPR, HIPAA, and PCI DSS all have communication requirements that are well-defined. Other stakeholders the company may need to communicate with include the public, investors, and the company's cyber insurance company in a crisis. And procedures for the order and timing of contact should be created so we know who we're contacting first and what that flow looks like. Incidentally, I'm seeing increasingly that cyber insurance providers require that they are the first point of contact in the event of a security incident, in which case they may actually drive the communication sequence for you. I don't expect you're going to be tested on that last bit. I just wanted to throw that real-world experience in there for you. So who is responsible for communication? Well, if a customer has impacted data, the company is always responsible for timely communication with that customer. If we have a data breach, the company must contact customers. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. This is true regardless of the cloud service model that's in use, and even if the CSP is at fault. So the bottom line with timely communication and shared responsibility is it's not really a shared responsibility. So let's talk about shared responsibility for security. So application security, for example. Responsibility varies by model, and we always, as a customer, have the most responsibility in the IaaS model, and our responsibility is less as we move through PaaS and to software as a service. Network security, same thing, although you'll notice there that our customer responsibility is, is nil for PaaS and SaaS. Host infrastructure, our service provider is dealing with all of the physical and most of the host level requirements, even in the IaaS model. Physical security, that's the CSP responsibility across the board. Data classification, 
is customer driven. As a customer, we have to classify and protect our data. That's our responsibility. And then identity and access management. You see that the customer has at least shared responsibility throughout all cloud models. The bottom line here is that the customer has responsibility throughout the process when it comes to application security and access and data protection and identity and access management. The customer always plays a role in access control and data security. And the customer is always in the driver's seat and fully responsible when it comes to timely communication with impacted parties in the event of a security incident. Up next is 5.6, Manage Security Operations. In this section, we'll touch on the Security Operations Center, intelligent monitoring of security controls with a look at firewalls, IDS and IPS, honeypots and more, log capture and analysis, and here we're going to get further into the SIM function and the log management function related to the SIM, and we'll finish up 5.6 with a look at incident management and vulnerability assessments. But let's start with the Security Operations Center. This is a support unit designed to centralize a variety of tasks and personnel at the tactical and operational levels. We typically refer to the Security Operations Center as the SOC, and it's worth noting that both the CSP and a consumer should typically have a SOC function. So what are the key functions of the Security Operations Center? Well, they include functions like threat prevention, threat detection, incident management, continuous monitoring and reporting, alert prioritization, and compliance management. Now your CSP dashboards, like Azure Status, the AWS Service Health Dashboard, and the Google Cloud Status Dashboard, give us a look at service health, but also the scope of the services that our major CSPs are managing through their SOC function. So here's another opportunity for a quick Real world glance, let's take a look at those cloud health and service status dashboards from our major CSPs. I'll switch to a browser and we'll take a look first at the AWS health dashboard. And you see here, I can look at service health by region, by date, and then by service listed in alphabetical order. And that's without being logged in. So anyone can see that status. And I'll switch over to the Azure status portal. And if I scroll down here again, I see some service health by region and services listed in alphabetical order. And if I then switch over to Google Cloud Service Health, we get again a similar view. And you will find that some aspects of service health, like if you'd want to look at the aspects of service health that apply to your subscription and your resources, you may have to log in with read access or better. Next, we have monitoring, which is really a form of auditing that focuses on active review of log file data. And monitoring can take many different perspectives. We can hold subjects accountable for their actions, for example. Another aspect of monitoring would focus on system performance. And another facet of monitoring would include tools like IDS, or SIMS to automate monitoring and to provide real-time analysis of events from our logs, and in the case of a SIM, potentially correlating events across those logs. Now, monitoring security controls used to be an activity closely related to formal audits that occur relatively infrequently, often annually or less. But monitoring is something we now do continuously, and it's described, the, the concept of continuous monitoring, in NIST SP 800-37, the Risk Management Framework. And the Risk Management Framework specifies the creation of a continuous monitoring strategy for getting real-time risk information. Network firewalls, web app firewalls, your intrusion detection and prevention systems provide critical sources of information for our Network Operation Center or Security Operation Center teams. And your firewalls and your IDS and IPS devices are processing a lot of information and they should be continuously monitored to ensure they are functional so we don't miss any important events. Monitoring for functionality would include monitoring log generation, centralized log aggregation, 
and the device analysis of those logs. Let's take a look at a few different firewall concepts, and we'll start with hardware versus software firewalls. So a hardware firewall is a piece of purpose-built network hardware. It may offer more configurable support for LAN and WAN connections versus a software firewall. It's also typically going to have better throughput versus software because it's hardware designed for the speeds and connections common in an enterprise network. Now in the cloud, a hardware firewall is virtual. It's a network virtual appliance or NVA for short. Now a software-based firewall is software that you would install on your own hardware. You'd put a software firewall on a physical or virtual server, for example. Now this is going to give us flexibility because we can place firewalls anywhere we'd like in the organization simply by installing that software. On servers, workstations, and you can run any sort of host-based firewall as long as you have a server to install it on. The downside that comes with that flexibility is host-based software firewalls are more vulnerable to being disabled by attackers. You know, oftentimes they simply have to disable a service to disable that firewall if they can establish a presence on that host. An application firewall caters specifically to application communications, layer seven in the OSI model. This could be any application traffic. Web traffic is very common. An example would be a web application firewall, or WAF for short. And a host-based firewall is a software firewall, an application installed on a host OS, like a Windows or Linux client or server operating system. You'll find host-based firewalls on both the client and server flavors of Windows and Linux. And then virtual firewalls. So in the cloud, firewalls are implemented as virtual network appliances, or VNA. Just a moment ago, I called that a Network Virtual Appliance, or NVA. That's not an accident. I wanted you to see it both ways. You'll see it referred to differently in different scenarios with different CSPs. And these are available both from the CSP directly and often from third-party partners, commercial firewall vendors, that will be listed in some sort of online marketplace attached to that CSP's cloud. And then we have stateless and stateful firewalls. So stateless means the firewall can watch network traffic and restrict or block packets based on source and destination addresses or other static values. It's not aware of traffic patterns or data flows. Typically it's faster and it performs better under heavier traffic loads because it's doing less work, frankly. A stateful firewall can watch traffic streams from end to end. It's aware of communication paths and it can implement various IP security functions such as tunnels and encryption. And it's better at identifying unauthorized and forged communications. But greater work means a stateful firewall is going to require greater processing power on the whole. There are several varieties of modern firewalls available in the cloud. A couple that you're likely to encounter at some point in your career are the web application firewall which protects web applications by filtering and monitoring HTTPS traffic between a web application and the internet. It typically protects web applications from common attacks like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, SQL injection, the top 10 OWASP threats. In fact, some of these firewalls will come pre-configured with OWASP rule sets, what they call the OWASP core rule sets. We actually looked at that earlier in the series. And then there's the next generation firewall, which is a deep packet inspection firewall that moves beyond port and protocol inspection and blocking. And it adds application level inspection, intrusion prevention, and it typically brings intelligence from outside the firewall, generally in the form of a threat intelligence feed that feeds real-time threat information or near real-time threat information to the firewall enhancing its ability to block information coming from malicious sources. And that ability to block traffic from malicious sources with that real-time information is something you will find commonly in the native firewall features that you get on your major CSP platforms like Azure and AWS. You may see these two abbreviated. The web app firewall is commonly called a WAF and the next generation firewall may show up as NGFW. You should also be familiar with the different types of intrusion, detection, and prevention. 
So an intrusion detection system, or IDS, generally responds passively by logging and sending notifications. It will identify a problem and notify us, but it typically does nothing, little or nothing, to correct it. An IPS system, or intrusion prevention, is placed in line with the traffic and includes the ability to block malicious traffic before it reaches the target. And then we have the host-based variety, so HIDs, or host-based intrusion detection systems, which can monitor activity on a single system only. The drawback is that attackers can often discover and disable these. And you may have some HIDs that are hardware-based and others that are software-based, but the host-based aspect can be considered a weakness. And then we have network-based intrusion detection, which can monitor activity on a network NIDS tends to not be as visible to attackers. Incidentally, the same distinction exists for intrusion prevention systems, so you'll also see reference to HIPS and NIPS, host-based IPS and network-based IPS. Next, we have a honeypot. So a honeypot is a system that has pseudo-flaws and fake data designed to lure intruders. As long as the attackers are in the honeypot, they're not in our live network. It's worth touching on the goals of a honeypot a bit more specifically. So it's to lure bad people into doing bad things with some limits. You want to entice folks, not entrap them. You're not allowed to let them download items with enticement. For example, allowing download of a fake payroll file would be what we call entrapment in U.S. law. So to be clear, the goal of a honeypot is to distract from real assets and to isolate that threat in a padded cell until you can track them down. And incidentally, a group of honeypots is called a honey net. The monitoring tools like a security information event management system, or SIM, use AI and machine learning to automate investigations and response. So I wanted to touch on these briefly to make sure you understand the difference. So artificial intelligence focuses on accomplishing smart tasks, combining machine learning and deep learning to emulate human intelligence. Machine learning is a subset of AI that involves computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience and the use of data. Machine learning gets smarter by processing data. And then deep learning is a subfield of machine learning concerned with algorithms inspired by structure and function of the brain called artificial neural networks. Then we have User Entity Behavior Analysis, or UBA, which is based on the interaction of a user that focuses on their identity and the data they would normally access during a normal day. It tracks the devices the user normally uses and the servers that they normally visit. And then we have Sentiment Analysis, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning to identify attacks. Cybersecurity sentiment analysis can monitor articles on social media, look at the text, and analyze the sentiment behind the articles. And over time, can identify a user's attitudes towards different aspects of cybersecurity. Now we're going to move into log capture and analysis in the context of the tooling we use in our security operations center that allows our organization to define our incident analysis and response procedures in a digital workflow format. So we're integrating our security processes and tooling in a central location, our SOC, leveraging response automation using machine learning and artificial intelligence in our SIM and SOAR functions. Now these make it faster than humans in identifying and responding to true incidents. It reduces mean time to detection and accelerates security response. It uses playbooks that define an incident and the action that will be taken. The capabilities are going to vary by the situation and the SIM vendor and your CSP for that matter. But over time, it should produce faster alerting and response for the SOC team. So let's break these down. We have SIM, Security Information Event Management, which is a system that collects data from many other sources within the network. So it is ingesting logs from many different sources, and it provides real-time monitoring, analysis, and correlation, as well as notification of potential attacks. And then we have the SOAR function, Security Orchestration, Automation, and Response, which is Centralized Alert and Response Automation with Threat-Specific Playbooks. 
I use that playbook term loosely. Many solutions use that term playbook, but it's going to be a bit different based on vendor. And the response may be fully automated or single click, what we'd call semi-automated. Some of these systems will do the analysis and the correlation and recommend an action, but require you to single click approve before it implements that action, before it takes that response. Many providers deliver these SEM and SOAR capabilities together in a single solution. And with very few exceptions today, they use AI, machine learning, and threat intelligence. So I promised we'd dig a bit deeper into the SEM function in Domain 5, but first I want to just do a quick recap of our introduction to the SEM function back in Domain 2. So, number one, our logs are worthless if you do nothing with the log data. Logs are made valuable by review, whether it's human, manual review, or it's automated. That is, they're valuable only if the organization makes use of them to identify activity that is unauthorized or compromising. The SEM function can help solve some of these problems by offering some key features. Log centralization and aggregation, data integrity, and normalization. So normalizing our logs into a common format that we can then hunt and query through. Automated or continuous monitoring, alerting, and investigative monitoring. Some automation of the investigation process. So let's take a look at some key SIM features necessary to optimize event detection and visibility and to scale security operations. First and foremost is log centralization and aggregation. So rather than leaving log data scattered around the environment on various hosts, the SIM platform can gather logs from a variety of sources, operating systems, applications that can be PaaS and SaaS applications for that matter, network appliances, user devices, providing a single location to support investigations. And with all that log data in one location, you can imagine that data integrity is very important. The SIM should be on a separate host with its own access control, preventing any single user from tampering with that log data. So separate host really speaks to physical or at least logical isolation, and that's where a cloud SIM can solve that problem for us. A cloud-based SIM is going to use cloud storage, will have its own access control, and can ensure that we have that access control boundary. Then normalization. A SIM can normalize incoming data to ensure the data from a variety of sources is presented consistently, and we can query across all of that log data from those many different sources. Automated or continuous monitoring, so sometimes referred to as correlation. SIMs use algorithms to evaluate data and identify potential attacks or compromises. So because we have centralized log data that's been normalized into a common format that we can query across, the automated investigative capabilities are going to have greater context because it can look at entity activity across our endpoints in our identity system, with our applications, on our network. So it's going to do a better job of capturing the full scope of a potential security incident and then can alert us, automatically generating alerts like emails or tickets when action is required based on analysis of that incoming log data. But not everything can be automated and that's why a SIM should support investigative monitoring. So when manual investigation is required, the SIM should provide support capabilities like querying log files and generating reports. But the SIM is giving us visibility across our entire technology estate, our data, apps, identities, endpoints, and infrastructure through that log centralization and aggregation. That broad SIM visibility across the environment means better context in log searches and security investigations. It really allows us to get our arms around the full scope of a potential security breach. And the key to that visibility is log collection. Of course, it will vary by SEM solution, but let's talk through some common log collection methodologies we see with a SEM. So a SEM typically has built-in log collector tooling that can collect information both from a syslog server and multiple other servers. Often we can place an agent on a device that can collect log information and parse and restructure the data and then pass that to the SIM for aggregation. Ingestion might be with an agent, such as on a Windows or a Linux server or a syslog server. We can capture that syslog data and forward that. And in some cases, 
we'll see that data capture, that log aggregation happening through an API. Pretty common with SaaS services that API is our route for aggregation. But that aggregation is really correlating and aggregating events so that duplicates are filtered and a better understanding of network events is achieved to help identify potential attacks. And then packet capture. We can capture packets and analyze them to identify threats as soon as they reach your network, providing immediate alert to the security team if desired. And while I see that called out in some discussions, you know, packet capture is really more of a network construct. We're going to see that packet level focus happening with our IDS and IPS solutions and rolling some of that data up through our logs. Or with the SIM, we're really looking at the data coming from those devices that are at the front lines of the packet analysis. And then data inputs. Our SIM can collect a massive amount of data from a variety of sources like our network devices, our identity management system, our mobile device management system, our CASB, the Cloud Access Security Broker, our extended detection and response function at our endpoints, and really many more. So let's just talk about log ingestion with a SIM. Here's an example. So we have our SIM. It can collect logs from our SQL servers, for example, both IaaS and PaaS. Now, how that happens is going to vary by the solution. For IaaS, commonly we'll see an agent installed on that system. PaaS, we may be consuming those logs from storage or through an API. Our identity as a service solution, typically via an API connector. Our network virtual appliances, quite commonly we're collecting via a syslog connector of some sort. One of the solutions I work with very commonly, we install an agent on that syslog server and the agent then proxies that syslog data over to our SIM. Our XDR solution, that's our endpoint activity data. When we see a best in suite solution where the vendor that gives us our XDR functionality and our SIM vendor are one and the same, sometimes we'll see that the XDR will simply forward alert data over. Then we have our infrastructure as a service, our IaaS, our virtual machines. We're often collecting via a local agent. And then we have our CASB solution, our cloud access security broker. That's usage alerts, events related to how users are accessing and using our data with apps. So the data we collect from a CASB might be events, it might be alerts, it might be incidents. And again, a lot of times what we're collecting there depends on if the SEM vendor and the CASB vendor are the same vendor. For example, if Microsoft Azure is where you source your SEM solution, Microsoft Sentinel, and then Microsoft CASB solution, since you have a single vendor there, the vendor knows what data they've already processed on the CASB side, so maybe they'll just forward over the resulting alerts instead of sending over all the raw event data. Again, just an example. The CCSP is cloud agnostic. CSP agnostic. We're not focused on one vendor here. But with all that functionality, it's no wonder that the SIM is really a core tool of the Security Operations Center. Let's take a minute and go a level deeper on some of the log file data that our SIM solution might be ingesting. Because in any given environment, data is recorded in a variety of databases and different types of log files. System logs, security logs, application logs, firewall logs, proxy logs, syslog, and that data should be protected by centrally storing that log data and using permissions to restrict access. That's one of the functions of our SIM. And archive logs should be set to read only to prevent modification. But log files play a core role in providing evidence for our investigations. You want to be familiar with the many different types of log files a typical SIM solution might ingest. A network log. This log file can identify the IP and MAC addresses of devices that are attached to your network. This data is commonly sent to a syslog server, often a central syslog server. Our network-based intrusion detection and prevention can be important in identifying threats and anomalies from these. Log files from a proxy server can reveal our users who are visiting malicious sites intentionally or otherwise. The collective insight may be useful in stopping a distributed denial of service attack. When we have eyes on all of that network data across our network segments and devices, we can see common patterns in there. It allows our SEM to investigate with greater context. Web server logs 
can provide many types of information about web requests, so evidence of potential threats and attacks will be visible here. Information collected about each web session, IP address, request date, and time, the method that we see in HTTP like get or post, the browser that's used, what we call the user agent, and the HTTP status code. For example, the 400 series HTTP response codes are client-side errors and the 500 series response codes are server-side errors. But these logs must be fed to our SIM in order for it to analyze that data. And these files may exist on client systems as well as server systems. So sending these to a SIM can help establish that central audit trail across all of our endpoints to give us greater visibility, greater context into the scope of the attack. So on a Windows system, for example, we'll have a system log that contains information about hardware changes, updates to devices, date and time synchronization, group policy application. We have the application log that has information about software applications, when they're launched, success or fail, warnings about potential problems or errors, and then the security log that contains information about successful login as well as unauthorized attempts to access the system and its resources. It can identify attackers trying to log into your computer systems. It captures information on file access and can determine who has downloaded certain data. You will find these log files with these names in the event viewer on any Windows client or server machine. As the administrator of your client and server systems, you are responsible for dialing up or down the level of security event logging to make sure that you are at the very least capturing the minimal audit trail. Virtually every DNS server will log server level activity like zone transfer, DNS server errors, caching, and DNSSEC events. Most of your DNS servers will have query logging disabled by default due to the sheer volume of DNS queries that come in to the typical DNS server. Authentication logs, information about login events, logging success or failure can come from a variety of sources depending on your identity and access model. Those sources might include the RADIA server for your VPN access, Active Directory domain controllers, and cloud providers like Azure Active Directory and Google's identity provider if you have a hybrid cloud environment. And log files related to voice applications even can be valuable in identifying anomalous activity, unauthorized users, and even potential attacks. I'm a bit in the weeds here, but your VoIP and call managers capture information on the calls being made and the devices they originate from, and they may capture call quality by logging some mean optical score and jitter data, and significant loss in quality may indicate attack. So typically from these call managers, we would want to be capturing these potential events and alerts indicative of attack. This may come from a syslog, but we'd want to capture some of that data. And each call often is logged inbound and outbound, the person making the call and receiving that, including long distance calls. That goes beyond what you typically collect in a SIM, but you have another level you could go to for some manual investigation. And your session initiation protocol information, this is used for internet-based calls and the log files generally show the 100 series event known as the invite, the initiation of a connection that relates to the ringing, the 200 event which is followed by an acknowledgement. A large number of calls not connecting may indicate attack. At the end of the day, VoIP phones are embedded systems. It's an embedded computer of sorts that must be secured, and the logs generated here can be significant. We might just be capturing this data via syslog, but it's another source of information, another source of context for our SIM solution. Okay, moving on to reporting. So a SIM typically includes dashboards and collects report data that can be viewed regularly to ensure that the policies have been enforced and the environment is compliant. And they can also highlight whether the SIM system is effective and working properly. Are incidents raised truly positives or are we seeing a lot of false positives in there? False positives may arise because the wrong input filters are being used or the wrong hosts are being monitored or some hosts are not being monitored that should be. And SIM solutions will typically have dashboards that include views into the status of log ingestion as well as potential security concerns identified through 
correlation and analysis of the logs the sim has ingested. So this is a good opportunity to take another detour and a quick look at a real sim solution. We're going to take a look at a cloud-based sim just to give you some context into sim functionality in case you're not familiar. So I'll just switch over to the Microsoft Azure portal here and I'm going to look at Microsoft Sentinel, which is Microsoft's cloud-based sim. And I'm looking at the Sentinel portal here, just the central dashboard. And if I scroll down, I see functions here such as a view into incidents under threat management. I see a hunting interface where I can make raw queries against that normalized data. And in fact, this solution provides many canned queries that I can simply enable or pull in from a gallery. And if I scroll down a bit further, we see data connectors. This is what I wanted to talk to you about, and that is that log collection focus. So you'll notice here it mentions there are 127 connectors. They appear to be listed alphabetically. I can filter them by providers, for example, and you'll notice a wide variety of providers here. Now I'll just search on some keywords to show you some themes. Let's search on the word firewall. We see here Azure Firewall, Microsoft's native firewall, the Microsoft WAF, but also a variety of third-party solutions. I can also search for syslog, and just as you'd imagine, there's a syslog connector that allows me to ingest data from my central syslog solution. And you'll even notice here in the A's that we see Amazon Web Services, so I can ingest data from another CSP's platform. Uh, common web servers, there's Apache. Scrolling down here, Azure Active Directory, I can get into my identity provider. Some DDoS data from Azure DDoS. Uh, logs from my Key Vault solution. And what you'll find with some of these connectors, depending on the solution you're working with, if it's collecting data from a service on the same CSP platform, the connector may just require a couple of clicks. So I'm going to look at the Azure Active Directory connector and I'll open that connector page and see what sort of configuration is required. And I notice here it's quite simple. I can tell it which Azure AD logs I would like to collect and it's going to begin collecting those for me. All I have to do is apply those changes. So that's just a quick look, but you see now that with a modern enterprise SIM solution, with a cloud SIM in particular, we're going to have some built-in connectivity to a wide variety of sources that make that wide ingestion of log data much less work for us. We're going to shift gears now and talk incident response, and the CCSP Common Body of Knowledge explores NIST SP800-61, the Computer Security Incident Handling Guide. So that's the methodology I'd suggest you focus on for the exam. Now, first-party incidents are internal to the organization. These are incidents that begin inside our organization and we are principally responsible for handling. Third-party incidents affect an external entity like our CSP or a vendor in our supply chain. We certainly may have a role in incident response there, although it may be simply as an informed party. The first phase in the NIST model is preparation. This refers to the organization's preparation necessary to ensure they can respond to a security incident, including tools, processes, competencies, and readiness. So those details should be documented in a security incident response plan that is regularly reviewed and updated. Typically, plan review happens multiple times per year in a walkthrough, what we call a tabletop exercise where we walk through the plan together in a sample scenario to make sure that the steps we need documented in our response are present and we are familiar with our role. Then we have detection and analysis, the activity to detect a security incident in a production environment and to analyze all events to confirm the authenticity of the security incident. In other words, do we really have a security incident on our hands? Next is containment, eradication, and recovery. So in containment, the required and appropriate actions taken to contain the security incident based on the analysis done in the previous phase, in detection and analysis. This limits the damage, the scope of the incident we're containing. 
Eradication is the process of eliminating the root cause of the security incident with a high degree of confidence. And during the incident, our focus is on protecting and restoring business critical processes. Recovery should happen after the adversary has been evicted from the environment and known vulnerabilities have been remediated. Recovery returns the environment to its normal, fully functional, original state prior to the incident. And a post-mortem analysis is often performed after the recovery of a security incident. And actions performed during the process are reviewed to determine if any changes need to be made in the preparation or detection and analysis phases. Basically, how can we improve our incident response process? And those lessons learned drive continuous improvement, ensuring effective and efficient incident response. We're going to talk about vulnerability assessments now, but first I want to touch on our right to audit in the cloud. So when we're talking about vulnerability scanners, the use of scanners and pen testers may be limited by your CSP's terms of service. And you should understand the type and frequency of testing the CSP allows. Now the good news is CSPs typically have penetration testing and scanning rules of engagement. In fact, I'll just switch over to a browser here and I'll show you these. If you just go search for AWS pen testing rules of engagement, do the same for Azure and Google, you'll find pages like this. This is AWS's customer support policy for penetration testing. The Microsoft version, in fact, is listed as the pen testing rules of engagement. So this will let you know what is okay and not okay in terms of turning your vulnerability scanner on your CSP's platform. Our vulnerability management process includes routine vulnerability scans and periodic vulnerability assessments. We use a vulnerability scanner, a tool that can detect known security vulnerabilities and weaknesses and absence of patches or weak passwords on the systems in our environment. And we can use that scanner to facilitate a vulnerability assessment to extend just beyond technical scans and include review and audit to detect vulnerabilities and to further assess their severity. So going a level deeper on vulnerability scans, a scan can assess possible security vulnerabilities in computers, networks, and equipment that can be exploited. And this scanning can sometimes require authentication for access. So a credentialed scan is typically a much more powerful version of the vulnerability scan because it has higher privilege than a non-credentialed scan. This can spot vulnerabilities that require privilege like non-expiring passwords. A non-credentialed scan has lower privileges than that credentialed alternative and it will identify vulnerabilities that an attacker would easily find. A non-credentialed scan is going to find missing patches, some protocol vulnerabilities, but the credentialed scan is going to allow you to go a level deeper. And we can perform non-intrusive scans, which are passive and merely report vulnerabilities. They don't cause damage to your system. We can perform intrusive scans that can cause damage as they try to exploit the vulnerability and should be used in a sandbox, not your live production system, of course. And then we have a configuration review. Now, configuration compliance scanners and desired state configuration in PowerShell, for example, ensure no deviations are made to the security configuration of a system. It allows us to catch shift and drift in our configuration, so to speak. But the combination of techniques can reveal which vulnerabilities are most easily exploitable in a live environment. So network scans. These are scans that look at computers and devices on the network and help identify weaknesses in their security. We have application scans. So before applications are released, coding experts perform regression testing that will check code for deficiencies, but we can also turn a scanner on those applications before they go live. Web application scans will crawl through a website as if they are a search engine looking for vulnerabilities. Can perform an automated check for site and application vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting and SQL injection. There are many sophisticated web application scanners out there due in part to mass adoption of cloud computing. You'll also want to know the difference between 
Static application security testing and dynamic application security testing for the exam. We covered that in a previous domain. And common vulnerability exposure and common vulnerability scoring system. So CVE and CVSS. If you've spent any time in the security world, you've probably seen these acronyms. CVSS is the overall score assigned to a vulnerability. It indicates a severity and it's used by many vulnerability scanning tools. If you're using a vulnerability scanner, you're almost certainly going to see that CVSS scoring metric. And CVE is simply a list of all publicly disclosed vulnerabilities. Included is the CVDID, a description, dates, and comments. Both of these are used broadly in vulnerability scanners. The CVSS score is not reported in the CVE listing. You actually have to use the National Vulnerability Database to find CVSS scores. The CVE list feeds into the National Vulnerability Database. And the National Vulnerability Database is a database maintained by NIST that is synchronized with the MITRE CVE list. I do not expect the exam to go this deep on CVE and CVSS. I just thought it would be helpful for you to know and appreciate the relationship between the two. So a vulnerability scanner can identify and report various vulnerabilities before they're exploited. So examples here would be software flaws, missing patches, open ports, services that should not be running, weak passwords. This is going to help companies avoid known attacks like the SQL injection, your buffer overflows, denial of service, other types of common malicious attacks. And that credentialed vulnerability scan is really going to be the most effective because it gives us more information than any other variety of scan. And it's going a layer beyond what a typical attacker will have available to them in their initial passes in our environment. So a scan assesses the possibility of the exploit and when we get that report we'll see sometimes false positives which is where the scan believes that there is a vulnerability but when we physically check it it's not there a false negative when there is a vulnerability but the scanner doesn't detect it the true positive which is where the results of the system scan agree with the manual inspection we perform after the scan but the fact that we have false positives and false negatives point to the reality that log reviews are very important. After the scan, it's important we look at the log files and reports that come from our scanner. And congratulations, you've made it to the end of Domain 5 of the CCSP exam cram. I hope you're getting value from the series. As always, if you have questions, drop a comment below the video. Come find me in LinkedIn chat and let's talk. And I'll look forward to seeing you in Domain 6. So until next time, take care and stay safe.